Sa Majesté, le roi, la comtesse du Barry. I was lucky to have watched the recent movie about the scandalous mistress of the French king Louis XV shortly after its premiere in France. And while everyone is talking about the truly historic role of Johnny Depp, indeed, imagine an American playing the French king in the French movie speaking French, and the overall um, questionable composition, let's put it like that, of the film itself, it thankfully still draws attention to a really remarkable female character that left the mark in the French history, the king's last and really outstanding mistress Madame du Barry. Attention, the recent film with Deb and My Wen turned out to be over a romanticized version of the historically accurate live events behind these personages. In this video I won't share any spoilers for the movie, yet give you a general idea of who was the real Jeanne du Barry and what was the true story of her way to the top of the French society up until the tragic end of this 18th century social climb fairy tale. Et voici Jeanne Vaubernier, dit l'ange. Un ange tombé du ciel. And yes, most of the scenes in the movie were filmed at the stunning premises of the Royal Palace in Versailles near Paris, exactly where it happened in real life. So I won't digress from the plot line and invite you to immerse yourself in this epoch right at the very place where it, this unbelievable story unfolded. First of all, let's establish the time frame and the key protagonists. So, here we are in the second half of the 18th century. The European Age of Enlightenment is in full swing and France is living through its last exuberant decades of absolute monarchy. Louis XV, the great-grandson of the notorious Sun King Louis XIV, has been on the throne for over 50 years. By the time he met his beloved mistress, he has already lost his wife, the Queen Marie Leszczynska, and his son, Dauphin Louis Ferdinand, and his previous favorite, who then became his dearest friend and confidant, Madame de Pompadour. He was quite a popular monarch at the beginning of his reign. Well, technically, he became a king at the age of just five years old, so in any case it's hard to hate a child, right? He even had a nickname, Le Bien Aimé, the Beloved, which was evidently omitted by the time of his death when he left the country to his grandson in almost pre-revolutionary state. Sa Majesté le Roi aimerait revoir Madame. Très bien. Quand cela? Maintenant, s'il est possible à Madame. Jeanne du Barry was a famous and highly successful courtesan who made it to the utmost heights of the industry, if I may, and became the maîtresse en titre, the chief royal mistress or favorite of the king. Wait a minute, you might say, official mistress? Is it like a real job post? Well, my friends, we are in France, so brace yourself, they call it the French kiss for a reason. Surtout, ne regardez pas le roi dans les yeux. Ce serait perçu par la cour comme une invitation. Une invitation à quoi À la bagatelle. Yeah, let's begin with ground zero. In the mid-1760s, Jeanne du Barry was still a mere courtesan in the bustling French capital. No, not an ordinary one. She had powerful clients, companions, let's put it like that. The rumor of her truly remarkable beauty attracted the crème de la crème of Parisian society. Dukes, earls and statesmen, most of whom valued her smart personality in addition to her charming looks. Frankly speaking, Jean wasn't du Barry at the epoch. In the French language, these articles de, de la ou du are the rudimental signs of nobility. Simply put, they are like off in English. Caroline of Brunswick, Charlotte of Mecklenburg Strelitz, for example. Back in the day, a de in the surname 
wasn't a rudiment and usually signified that the person belongs to some noble landowning family. Jeanne's roots were far away from being aristocratic. She was born in 1743 to her commoner mother, Anne Bécu, later on son, who was a seamstress and the identity of her father remains unknown until today. There were rumors ignited by Jean herself that it might have been apprised Jean-Baptiste Gomard of Vaubénier or his relative Jean-Jacques, yet no bulletproof evidence has been found ever since. There were basically only two ways to proceed in life for a girl of her social status. First one, she could have stayed in service and become a modiste or flower girl or maybe grow to have her own little shop. Or she could have tried herself in the shady yet way more joyful at the first sight circles of the demi-monde. Mimonde and the girls who ruled the Mimondin have stepped onto the glittering yet slippery path of becoming mistresses or prostitutes next to the men in power and simply those who had money. They were usually one and the same people in the 18th century France. Are you familiar with Honoré de Balzac and his multi-volume sequence of human comedy La Comédie Humaine? He spent a great deal of time describing the life of this vulnerable social class, particularly in his fabulous splendors and miseries of courtesans. Another sneak peek of the world was given by Alexandre Dumas fils in La Dame aux Camélias, The Lady of the Camellias. So, those who have read those French masterpiece novels would immediately recognize the type of the girl we are talking about. For those who haven't yet, I'll give some helpful tips. They were coming from insecure lower classes in society with malfunctioning social lifts that wouldn't allow them to make a career and jump over to another stratum in one generation. They would possess some natural beauty and liberal spirit, be light-hearted, fun and friendly, eager to become a companion for a gentleman when he needed that, and meekly hide in the shadow when the rules of the daylight society would require so. That's why they were called Mimonden. Mi means half in French. So, in such a couple, a man would usually come from the legit society, monde or ton, and a girl or woman wouldn't be even accepted by the proper polite society. In other words, only half of the pair is someone who is noticed and socially accepted. The other part is barely tolerated. I said tolerated for the purpose. In fact, it wasn't much of a secret that the majority of gentlemen would have a mistress or spend time in the company of several female companions in addition to a lawful wife. This was a sort of unspoken status quo, a bit uncomfortable perhaps, but a working solution to keep your image of a married person and at the same time indulge yourself in the wonders of Parisian nightlife. The key component here was money. One would have to afford that somehow. And that was the key performance indicator. KPI for a successful courtesan. How much was she worth was a merit of her success in this field. And believe me, the best of them were the richest women in Paris. Well, most of them, if not all, sooner or later ended up their lives in misery. Yet that's a whole nother story. Back to Jean. She was lucky. By the age of 25, she has secured an impressive lot of clients. The famous Duke of Richelieu was one of them. She had established a sort of partnership with one of her first noble friends, Count Jean Dubarry. It almost looks like the versions of the same name in this pair, Jean et Jean, weren't a coincidence. Both were really industrious and notorious when it came to their financial independence. Jean Dubarry didn't have a stable income. The legitimacy of his noble title of count was questionable, but all that didn't prevent him from enjoying life to the fullest. He was of rather liberal spirits and found creative ways to support his lavish lifestyle. He was a gambler uh, and a pimp for his proper lover. 
sois gracieuse. Comme tu sais l'être, tu as tout le reste. Pas peur. Pas peur. <laughs> Once he fed his personal appetite with Jean, he came up with an idea that, let's put it bluntly, he could sell her services for other men and then split the money with Jean herself. Everything worked smoothly and in 1765 he came up with an almost insane idea of presenting her to the king. Jean Dubarry veut que je vous présente au roi. That was a truly daring plan, but it worked. Apparently, the charm of young Jean made the king spot her out of court crowds at Versailles and make her his lover. For those of you who have watched the film and will do that in the future, mark this difference. The real life Jeanne was only 25 when she was presented to the king. The fictional heroine of my Wen is almost twice older. Up until this point, nobody in the royal entourage worried about the situation. Yes, a courtesan. Yes, at the court. Awful, disgusting. But okay, she's just a girl for a night for two nights, well, a week. She will soon fade away, so we keep calm and carry on. Imagine the surprise of the crowds when Zhang, the daughter of a seamstress, was nominated the official mistress to the king. Oh, his favorite. You've probably heard the names of Marquise de Pompadour, Madame de Maintenon, Agnès Sorel or Madame de Poitiers. They all were holding this official post at the courts of various French kings. Yes, kings had lawful wives. They were queens. They were respected, they were bearing royal children, but there was this huge but. They were not loved. All the fun and love went for the favorites. It's amusing how they managed to get this disposition somewhat officially fixed in the court order. The ultimate state of unbelievable hypocrisy, one of the tons of other broken things that led this country to the bloody revolution. Back to the newly crowned favorite. It was only then that Jean became Du Barry. Did you get why and how? Uh -uh, it wasn't so straightforward, at least in terms of how. Despite the otherwise outrageously liberal spirits at the court, they still needed some official procedures before anyone would legitimately show up next to the sovereign. You can love a courtesan king, yet a courtesan can't become your favorite. But no worries, we've got you covered even in this tricky situation. Let's just quickly marry our mistress to some titled guy and this way whitewash her background. Did you get this idea? Only an officially married woman could become the favorite to the king. And yeah, her noble husband shouldn't better have an important position at the court. How do you like that? Well, that certainly adds up another level of zest to the whole disposition. As if only the mere existence of the role of the chief royal mistress wasn't enough. So, in the case of Jean and her smooth operator Jean Dubarry, everything would be covered up swiftly. The only issue was Jean was already married. What a pity! But he still managed to get the hefty sum from the king and solve this awkward problem. He offered some percentage to his single brother, Guillaume du Barry. The latter didn't think twice and the next day he and Jeanne were married in the Saint Laurent church in Paris. The very moment they were declared husband and wife, Guillaume disappeared in the dark and the newly went Countess Jean du Barry was presented to the court as the official mistress to Louis XV. Obviously, nobody swallowed this cheap countess decoration. King's daughters were mad. The younger one even went to a convent and took the veil to cover up her father's sins. 
ministers were angry. The thing is, historically, the role of the favorite gave a huge room for intrigue against different parties, and everyone worried Jeanne du Barry would try to impose her own political agenda on the king. Le premier ministre ne va pas tolérer que vous laissiez une fille des rues côtoyer votre entourage. Cette jeune femme est mon entourage. Another newlywed, this time to the heir to the throne, the teenager Dauphine Marie Antoinette, was particularly cruel to Jean, who eclipsed her at court. You see, back in the day, the rules at the French court dictated that the one with the inferior rank can't address the one with the superior rank. Marie Antoinette, la Dauphine, the future queen, used this privilege of her superiority and never said a word to Jean directly, this way showing her and everyone around the animosity she felt for the former courtesan who was just desperately trying to become a friend for her. This historical conversation boycott and how it resolved was addressed in the movie, so I'll let you see it yourself. Appears that everyone's animosity was in vain, since young Jean had no plans to interfere with politics and was indeed very much in love with the aging king, who in turn was madly in love with her. Once he got her present, the black page Zamor. This was another unheard of gesture that left nobody indifferent. Poor Zamor, he was the target of painful racist arrows from ruthless courtiers, yet appears like Jeanne was truly fond of him in her own way and supervised his education. His recollections of her were different, and later in life he turned his back on her and betrayed her. His story is truly unique and I think is worth a dedicated video. Just like other favorites before her, Jean became a trendsetter in terms of fashion. She was known to become the first woman in the French court to appear in male dress in public. In fact, she was indifferent to her clothes, preferring a certain romantic carelessness in dress. The thing the court ladies harshly critique her for, and nevertheless, followed her daring attitudes. She was a keen art lover and the patron of arts and became friends with the most famous artists and thinkers of her time, keeping the friendship with Voltaire until his death in 1778. The king also gifted her a personal residence, Chateau de Louvesien, where she spent her time when falling out of favor and after the king's death. Here you can see that it has survived in a decent state until our days. All in all, she managed to keep the cabinet of the official mistress for six years until the very death of the king from smallpox in 1774, at the age of 64. One of the first decisions of new king, Louis XVI, was to imprison the former favorite of his grandfather in a secluded monastery. Jeanne was only 33 then, and even in exile, her life was far away from its end. Despite her controversial past, she managed to make friends with the nuns and the abbess, and some of her former powerful friends at the court made everything to secure her release, so the new king, Louis XVI, had to surrender and let her out after about a year at the monastery. Jeanne was still very young, her beauty was apparently with her. She still had a beautiful chateau and some decent means of financial support she earned in the past. So the feast of life didn't stop for her. She got together with Duke of Brissac, who felt for her years before and patiently waited for his chance ever since. They say they fell madly in love, and overall Jean lived a happy and trouble-free life. However, looks like she never learned the basics of political intrigues and never paid attention to how the wind blows. When the first waves of the French Revolution unfolded in the late 1780s, she didn't flee the country and carried the same lifestyle she used to in the years of the fluff of absolute monarchy.
She didn't consider herself an aristocrat, and the rebels seemed to have forgotten about her in those years, and she kept corresponding freely with some émigré monarchists who fled to England and other countries afraid for their heads. Eventually, she came onto the radar of the angry public, and following the path of her previous friends and foes at the court, the same Marie Antoinette, for example, she reluctantly climbed the scaffold at the Place de la Concorde in central Paris. Rumor has it her last words before the end were One more moment, Monsieur Executioner. That was the true story of the remarkable Jeanne du Barry. Her figure is veiled with mystery. Coming from nowhere, she made it to the top of the French society and claimed the most powerful female position at the court. Today they often paint her in feminist colors. I doubt if she really was one. She lived in another time when values and merits were counted differently. Yet one thing is unattainable there. She knew how to love. She knew how to make friends. She was loved and cherished, and she drank her joy of living to the last drop. Thank you for going through the life of Jeanne du Barry with me here today. Her portrait opens up a gallery of other, no less captivating life stories of her compatriots on my channel. I hope you decide to subscribe and see you in my other videos. Bye!